Um, this is the first that we've done from a virtual perspective. So bear with us as we sort of work through that and change our screens up. But we do have with us on screen here, and I'll make it large so you guys can see it. Our speaker today, um, Shelly Fole, who is the president and CEO of Safe Sports. And she'll be talking to us a little bit, so I'll give a little bit of an introduction to her and to what her program is. But I also want to acknowledge that we have a few people in the room. We have Dr. Malagrao, we have Jack, Dr. Jack Watson, and then Dr. Ed Epps will stay on the hall a little bit. All part of the Ethics Center, the Sports Ethics Center, and the stuff that we're working with to try to provide students with a cutting edge um, perspective on what's going on with sports ethics as it's such an important part of many of the different fields that you guys are going to go into, whether it be coaching, sports management, or exercise psychology, but it really is an important topic. So we'll be talking about that a little bit today. And I was really excited when Shelly agreed to come and speak with us. She's the President and Chief Executive Officer of the United States Center for Sports, Safe Sports. And Safe Sports was originally a piece of the USOC, and they have grown and expanded beyond that, and they're now a, um, the first national <laughs> nonprofit dedicated to preserving safety and well-being of athletes, and they work collaboratively with the sports organizations to ensure a culture of safety through awareness, best practices, education, and training. And she's going to tell you a little bit about that today. In addition to the work she's doing here, just to give you an idea of the, the work that she's done in the past, she spent the last six years at the appointment of the President, Barack Obama, during his um, time in office as the Executive Director of the President's Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition. And prior to that, she's worked extensively uh, with several different organizations as executive director, leadership positions, development positions around the inclusion and the participation of sport and physical activity for uh, children and individuals. And so she's quite a great depth of knowledge in this area and very passionate around all this. I had the opportunity to go meet with her when she was still in D.C. back in, I think it was October last year, and see what they were doing over at the, the President's Council. And I am really excited to see what they're doing here. So. What we're going to do is in a moment, I'm going to switch over and I'm going to give her our screen and we're going to drop down her video. We'll leave her, the audio, the video up of you guys so she can see who she's talking to. And she'll go through her presentation from her screen. And then at the end, we'll switch back over and bring the um, video feed back up so that we can do some question and answer. All right? So let me, if you want to go ahead and, and drop your webcam and I will share screen. I remember how to do it. And Did it come up? It is perfect. All right. And I'm going to make this as small as possible. All right. Well, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to everybody um, Shelly Cole with Safe Sports. Great. Good morning, everyone. C can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Well, thanks for allowing me to join you this morning. Um, greetings from Denver. Um, as, as Kristen said, I was in D.C. for actually uh, seven years and then before that in North Carolina for about 20 years. So um, I'm missing the East Coast just a little bit, um, but I'm, I love Denver as well. I just moved here a couple months ago. Um, so I, I, I'm excited to share more information information about the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. Um, well, they can get this. Here we go. There we go. So um, <clears throat> the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, as, as Kristen alluded to, was really chartered, created by the U.S. Olympic Committee. And um, <clears throat> if you the purpose and the reason that and the genesis of the center um, is really coming to light even in the past several months you would really say the past several years um, but today's usa today for example has a huge article about uh, abuse in sport um, if you've been reading or keeping up with the usa gymnastics um, uh, issues uh, that have been been going on USA swimming um, and Taekwondo and so forth. Um, I, I tell people, gosh, you know, I, I wish there wasn't a need for the Center for Safe Sport, but unfortunately there is. And um, what you see on the screen now, um, we know that about 45 million 
um, uh, youth in, in America participate in sport. And by the way, we're, our focus is not just on youth. It's all ages. It's all athletes at every level. Um, about one in five of those youth um, uh, report being bullied. About one in 10 will be victims of sexual abuse of some sort. So while we know that you know bullying and harassment and uh, abuse and misconduct are everywhere in our society, we also know that sport um, provides uh, perhaps a, a unique opportunity for misconduct to take place, quite frankly. And um, because obviously we have um, uh, teams participating, we have individuals participating, um, it provides an opportunity for uh, individuals to take advantage of not only youth, but again, adults um, that are in their, uh, under their purview. So um, our goal and the question that we asked is what if, what if sports first play, our first priority was to protect every athlete's emotional and physical safety? From that, we created our vision statement and our, and our purpose and so forth. So we envision a future where every athlete succeeds both on and off the field of play. <clears throat> um, those of you, I can see you, I know you can't see me right now, but um, how many of you played sports? Raise of hand, like almost everyone. Um, so you understand, you, you get, you understand um, what sports brings to our lives. You understand what being part of a team, um, the leadership skills, the perseverance, the dedication, all of those uh, 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 character development um, uh, places, spaces, if you will, um, that grow because of sport. You understand that. So our goal is to make sure that everybody, every athlete at every level, whether or not they ever become an Olympic athlete is, is completely irrelevant. But every athlete at every level um, from the hometown little league team um, all the way up to elite athletes, that they are safe, supported and strengthened through sport. That's what we want. And if one athlete at any level, one athlete at any level is turned away from sport because of bullying or harassment or hazing or sexual, physical or emotional misconduct, that is one too many. So that's, that's our bottom line. Our purpose uh, is to make sure that every athlete is able to thrive by, by fostering a national sport culture of respect and safety on and off the playing field. So again, sport culture. How do we change the culture in which we find ourselves in America? How do we truly change the culture? None, obviously that is, that is a, a tall task. Changing culture is not easy. It doesn't happen quickly and it takes, it's, it's going to take all of us. So there you see kind of our, our words of safe, supported and strengthened. Uh, that's part of our vision statement is that every athlete is safe, supported and strengthened through sport. What that means is that they're protected from emotional, physical and sexual abuse, um, that they're supported um, um, by being in respectful environments and, and that diversity among athletes is uh, embraced. <clears throat> They're strengthened um, by being able to utilize the skills that, that we know we learn as, by participating in sports um, and, and being able then to give back and be, a, be a, a productive, vivacious member of their communities. So how do we do that? Well, we, we build bridges. Um, we we you know, create a lot of partnerships um, and work with everyone from local grassroots organizations uh, to state um, coaching organizations to parent organization, parenting organizations uh, to youth sport administrators, all the way up to professional and elite level 
organizations, <clears throat> including all of, the, of our professional sports leagues. <clears throat> uh, we create alignment, certainly. Um, for example, um, just working with thought leaders throughout sport and, frankly, throughout the abuse prevention space. And this is an area, uh, certainly, uh, honestly, that's newer to me. My background, as you heard, is really in um, sport, uh, community health education, public health, uh, and the like. And so delving into the abuse side of things um, in that space has really been um, eye-opening for me. And so bringing these two together and really working to, to make a difference, quite frankly, um, is uh, certainly, uh, for me, will be the biggest challenge of my career. Um, <clears throat> so creating alignment, obviously working with sport, um, co a sport coaching um, organizations, those organizations that train coaches and certainly uh, Kristen's um, uh, organization that she leads up that, that, um, uh, that certifies um, you know, coaching organizations is a critical uh, cog, if you will, in making sure that all of our coaches, all of our coaches are uh, trained in safe sport principles and that are implementing safe sport um, policies and procedures wherever they are, wherever they are, or wherever they end up, wherever they're coaching. Um, and then we want to increase our capacity uh, to be able to um, move the dial forward in a, in a positive direction. <clears throat> um, there are organizations out there certainly that are concerned about the welfare of athletes. Um, we believe we are the first that has the sole, um, kind of the sole focus, the sole responsibility of um, ensuring the safety and uh, securing um, the uh, mental, the uh, uh, mental, emotional, physical uh, well-being of athletes. So that's all we do every single day. But again, we alone <laughs> will not be able to achieve success. I know there's a lot on this slide. I apologize. Uh, the, the bottom line for this slide is that we've kind of broken our work into two offices or two categories um, of work. One is education and outreach. And so we know that if we're truly going to change culture, that we have to create uh, awareness, education, training, um, not only for coaches, but for the athletes themselves, for youth sport organizers and adult sport organizers uh, for that matter, um, and parents. Um, so athletes and parents as well. Um, I always you know, bring this down to my own family. Um, so I have, I have probably 12 nieces and nephews. I don't know, I, I've lost count, but I have like 12 nieces and nephews. And I know my brothers and sisters they don't know what questions to ask their youth sport organization in terms of how qualified is that coach? What kind of background check does that has that coach had? What are the policies in place for when they might go out of town on a travel trip? Are there, are there policies in place that so that my child will never be alone with another adult, that there will always be two adults present whereby, where, where each child is concerned. Does that make sense? Um, so we call that too deep leadership. Hopefully you're, you're learning about um, those types of principles. Um, more and more, again, more policies, more best practices that can be put into place. But there's no doubt in my mind that my brothers and sisters don't know what questions to even ask. And they probably assume that the coaches and anyone associated with their child's team has been properly vetted and that there are policies and procedures in place. And um, unfortunately, that's just not the case. So I want parents to be empowered to ask the questions. Have, have your coaches had proper background checks? Have, have they gone through a safe sport training? Are they safe sports certified? 
what are your policies and procedures for how kids are treated on and off the, the, the playing field? Because again, we're not just talking about sexual abuse here. We're talking about emotional abuse, physical abuse, um, harassment, bullying, and so forth. So um, we, we, we want to empower parents. We want athletes themselves at every level and at every age to know what grooming behavior looks like. Um, what is proper and improper? Where is the line of emotional abuse? Sometimes that's not easy. Um, what's the line of physical abuse in sports? And, and, and so forth. So um, though we, want, we want to make sure that that training, that education and outreach um, side of what we do is robust. And that's where we'll be working with not only coaching associations, but parent organizations, local sport, local, state, and national uh, sport organizations to deliver those trainings and resources. And that, um, that part of what we do goes far beyond the Olympic and Paralympic movements. That said, so, and that, so it's, it's nationwide. The next, the other side of what we do, the response and resolution office is specific to the 47 national governing bodies of the, of the USOC. So the Olympic and Paralympic national govern, governing bodies that oversee uh, the Olympic and Paralympic sports. So what we do on the response and resolution side is that we um, <clears throat> actually take reports, we take cases of sexual misconduct, alleged sexual misconduct and abuse. Um, we receive those reports uh, and we investigate them and we hand out sanctions down to whoever the perpetrator may, may have been, could be a coach, could be an athlete, could be somebody else. Um, and um, the NGBs, of course, we work with the NGBs. Um, they uphold those sanctions. Uh, they make sure um, that, that those are carried out if it's a ban from sport, if it's, uh, if it's a warning, whatever it is, uh, whatever it might be. And it is, uh, by the way, um, it is then upheld throughout all of the Olympic movement. So a person couldn't uh, leave one sport and go to another um, and, and um, be accepted because once a sanction is handed out, it will be upheld by all 47 national governing bodies. So, uh, and that's specific to sexual abuse. We, you know, we will not take on um, reports of bullying and harassment. Those will take place. Those will be taken by and large by the national governing bodies themselves, um, unless, uh, unless it's an especially egregious case. So uh, at our discretion, we might take on something that's not of a sexual abuse nature. Um, what else did I want to tell you there? Um, oh, the other thing that the, the national governing bodies do themselves is that they help implement the training. They enforce the training. So now the USOC says to all of the 47 governing bodies, hey, if you want to be a member in good standing with the US Olympic Committee, you A, need to adopt the Safe Sport Code. And just so I don't forget, um, on our website, our website, which is safesport.org, safesport.org, org, um, you will see more information, but you will also be able to download the whole Safe Sport code. And the Safe Sport code has um, all of our kind of rules and regulations, if you will, but it also has kind of the policies and best practices uh, for um, sport organizations to follow. So the USOC now says, okay, NGBs, you must follow the Safe Sport Code. You have to train your people. They have to be certified, uh, Safe Sport certified, and you have to um, ensure it's your responsibility to make sure and check um, all of your, your members, if you will, um, around that. And again, that's not just for coaches, but for trainers, for physicians, for other people, anyone engaged um, in a meaningful way with athletes. So 
Here's, here are five things to know. Um, one is we, we do address all forms of harassment and abuse. So again, not just sexual abuse, but bullying, harassment, hazing, uh, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. Um, from a, from a education standpoint, we're concerned with all of those things. Um, we, again, we support athletes at, at all ages and comp at competition levels. So everything from, uh, you know, my niece and nephew's local um, little league team, all the way up to Olympic and, and elite athletes uh, and everyone in between of all ages. Um, we respond uh, to we use response to strengthen that prevention program. So again, the, the response and resolution side of what we do uh, really addresses that, uh, the sexual abuse piece. We leverage our reach to increase the impact of our, of our work. Um, so again, not only partnering with the U.S. Olympic Committee and its 47 NGBs, but really organizations, the NCAA, um, and organizations, coaching organizations, uh, youth sport organizations all across the country. And um, we use experts, thought leaders in this space at, at every turn. <clears throat> um, so bottom line is um, our, our goal is to expand what we do. We, we get financial support from the U.S. Olympic Committee and the NGBs. And then we go beyond that to um, foundations and corporations and individuals to expand uh, the work and the reach that we have. Um, so uh, ultimately, again, we want to cultivate a culture of respect and safety. Um, we are located in uh, Denver, as I mentioned earlier, and um, but obviously our work is na nationwide. Uh, it's interesting that um, the International Olympic Committee is now uh, getting involved, if you will, in safe sport. We have several countries that have approached us um, to assist with their kind of their code, their policies and procedures. Um, we have other countries coming to us uh, wanting to help them do training. Um, so we really hope to be a center of excellence, if you will, uh, uh, worldwide, not just for our country. Um, that said, technically, we've just opened our doors on March 3rd. So we are less than a month old, if you will, uh, in terms of being open and taking in cases from a response or resolution side. But there have been many years uh, of work that have brought us to this place. I just came on board in November, uh, but um, there has been work that has been done by many people uh, for the past several years that have gotten us to this place. So we feel like we are in a very good place to be, uh, to be uh, successful, um, that, that the work that has preceded us uh, in terms of us officially opening our doors um, will prove to be um, uh, very uh, fruitful uh, as we are able to uh, advance, um, advance our work. So um, I know, uh, I know, you know, those of you sitting in the, in the room, um, work in some way, shape, or form, and, and you know, with sports, around sports, um, you are looking to have careers that um, are specifically in sport or that intersect it in some meaningful way. And so um, you being ambassadors for safe sport uh, and the safe sport principles uh, will be really important as we collectively together uh, advance the youth sport principles. So um, I'm going to stop there and uh, and take any questions that you might have. Oh, I'll put your screen. If you want to put your video cam back up. All right, there we go. Perfect. So open it back up or open it for questions. Um, for a coach to become safe sport certified, would they do just like an online training thing or is it like a seminar that they would go to? What is yep. the uh, Yeah, if you, if you go to safesport.org and click on training, right now, and this may not always be this way, but right now you can actually go through the whole safe sport training and it's free. And just, you know, we currently in some of the ACE classes require students to do that. 
And if you're an NGB sport coach, from my understanding, should I correct me if I'm wrong, all the NGBs, if you hold a coaching license from any of the national governing bodies in your sport, you see track and field, you see swimming, etc. Yeah. You have to have right. a sport and you must renew it every single year. Correct. So, can you tell them a little bit more about the training? It's online and how long it takes? Ah, oh, gosh, that's a good question. Um, it, I, it takes a couple hours um, and there are different modules. Um, actually, when I, you know, when I was looking into this job, if you will, when I was uh, um, kind of gathering my own information about what, you know, what the center was about and for, I went through the training myself, and um, it's it's extremely helpful to understanding what the current issues are, um, what the what the problems are. Uh, and then how do, how do you as a coach, as a sport administrator, really be aware of that and help to prevent, uh, ultimately that's what we want to do. We want to prevent uh, the bad things from taking place. Um, so it would take a couple hours to get through the whole thing, but there are different modules, so you don't have to do it all at one time. Uh, if you could just go through the simple slide. Uh, way of explaining uh, the different levels of uh, how you said it ranges from youth to Olympic sport. How does your program uh, deal with athletes as they start in line? Sorry, Kristen, I, was, I had a hard time hearing that question. Can you repeat it? Sure. So he's, if I'm capturing it right, he's interested in the difference. How does your program deal with athletes at the different levels from youth sport all the way to elite? What are sort of your different perhaps takes or approaches to working with the different levels. Youth sport, gotcha. high school sport, collegiate sport, professional sport, Olympic sport. Right, right. Um, right now, um, right now, our focus has been on reaching out to athletes and sport administrators. Um, so my ultimate goal, and sooner than later, is to have specific training and education and outreach to athletes themselves and of course how we do that and the messaging that we have will differ for young um, young people young athletes versus teenagers versus adults etc um, so and and how we reach them will be different uh, and, and so forth so um, the best I can tell you right now is that we're working heavily with uh, the youth, the, the, I'm sorry, the sport coaching organizations, um, the, tr the training, obviously the USOC uh, trainings are, are where we've spent most of our time, but now, um, now that our responsive resolution is, office is up and running, now we can turn our, our attention and quite frankly our fundraising. Uh, we need more funds to be able to do the outreach and education that we need to do um, for parents and for athletes. Well, correct me if I'm stepping over this a little bit, but I think that one of the things we have to recognize is right now they're training really when you take it as a coach, it's one size fits all regardless of the level that you're coaching. But that's sort of universal in all of our coaching education in the United States at this point, is we tend to approach this as if all coaches, all coaching is the same and all athletes are the same. And there's a movement both nationally and internationally around right age, right stage, right coach. So you've got yeah. the right person for the job who knows the audience and the context. And that she mentioned earlier, the United States Center for Coaching Excellence, which is what we're doing. Uh, we're around the coach development content and material that. And as opposed to working specifically on this issue that, that the Safe Sports Center does, but that movement is what the future is for those of you who are going in different areas of coach, right age, right stage, right coach. Exactly, and thanks, Kristen, for that. And and that's exactly why we we are partnering with organizations uh, like Kristen's to make sure that we have the right approach that we are. Um, I guess diversifying our coaching education so it's not a one size fits all. Um, so you said that you cover athletes from all levels. Is there a more predominant area of abuse in uh, the lower level athletics from like little kids or to Olympic level athletes? And do you see areas that need more focus on dealing with the Levels. That's a great question and one that is not easily answered um, because there is not there is not good data. 
quite honestly. One of the one of our roles here at the center, of course, will be to gather data uh, as our our um, response and resolution office uh, accepts cases and reports and so forth. So we will we will have better data going forward. Um, you know, the abuse that you hear about is more on the youth um, youth space and. Uh, molest molestation and, and so forth, um, misconduct and abuse with young athletes. And um, so, but um, having said that, I think that's, you know, that's certainly what we hear about in the news, um, how that translates to really, um, you know, the, the prevalence levels is honestly, nobody knows, nobody knows. And that's unacceptable. Uh, I think we, we've got to have better data. Um, and now that part of what Safe Sport does is say that for those national governing bodies and, and anybody that's under under the national governing body jurisdiction, that they have to be mandatory reporters for sexual abuse and misconduct. Mandatory reporters. Regardless of what state laws say, um, they have to report to law enforcement and they have to report to us. Um, and again, we're not law enforcement. We're not the police. We're not the FBI. We are the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. The the code, the, the, the Safe Sport code goes beyond what law enforcement um, defines as sexual abuse. So someone could um, engage in a behavior, let's say harassment of some sort, let's say doesn't, doesn't um, trigger uh, a legal um, bar, if you will, so they might not be breaking a, uh, uh, a, a law, but it still may be breach the U.S., uh, the, the safe sport code. And so when we investigate, when we investigate, we're looking at how, if they've broken the safe sport code. Obviously, if they've broken a law, <laughs> then they've also broken our code. Uh, but our code is, is much broader than uh, what law enforcement would even look at. Um, so mandatory reporting, you all will be mandatory reporters, I feel sure, um, in some way, shape, or form. If you, uh, I would encourage you to look at uh, Senator Feinstein's bill um, that uh, is in Congress right now. As soon as I'm done here, I have a call with uh, some uh, congressional staff members to talk about that bill and our recommendations for how to make it better. Um, but uh, if you're following um, Senator Feinstein's bill, um, it is certainly a, a um, result of some of the abuse that you're hearing and seeing about. So uh, I'm sorry if I haven't answered that question fully. It, the, the, the bottom line is we just don't know. Which, which leads me to a great point. You're also doing it as a big hint for if you're talking to research projects and things you need to look into. Um, yeah. There have been a, a few studies done up in Canada and a few other places, and this is a really tricky place to do research, just so you think about it, whether we're talking about sexual misconduct or even just physical abuse. Because in certain sports, if your football coach hits you, hits you they're supposed to hit you. They're making you a man. And, and that line gets people have trouble com having conversations around. They're not supposed to scream at you. There's a difference between demeaning screaming and just being loud on the field. So it makes it really challenging. People don't want to talk about this. We've had some big challenges just trying to get people to talk about this in the first place. And um, I encourage you as students to do this. But Shelly, I have a question sort of to tag on that. The discussion of what Safe Sports sees its role as in terms of making the coaches and preparing them to be better reporters and protectors of the athletes, so policing themselves and other coaches so that you have situations where someone knows an abuse is going on but nobody says anything, or they know that the child's in a situation outside of sport and they're not. So we're making them mandatory reporters, potentially protectors. So what do you see as your role from that perspective, as well as to prepare the coaches to understand what abuse is so that their own behaviors don't cross those lines? How right, absolutely. And yeah, yeah. I think, you know, again, that's where the training comes into place, is understanding what abuse looks like or um, understanding what grooming behaviors looks like so that you as a coach, there may be someone outside of the team some, or, or someone associated with the team or 
heck, it could be a parent or a an older athlete or, or any, it could be anybody um, that is engaging, let's say, in grooming behavior. And if you can recognize that, um, you know, the goal is to stop it, to stop it before it gets to sexual abuse, right? And so being able to detect um, what some of those behaviors might be, uh, you know, within, um, you know, within your sphere of influence, um, whatever that might be, wherever you may end up in your, in your professional careers is critically important. Um, and sorry, Kristen, then the second part of your question? Well, just that idea that you've got the coaching part, the corners and protectors, but then also, I think you did answer it, actually, and then the difference between preparing them to see it in themselves. So I am looking yeah. at it when nobody else is doing it, but how am I also then checking and policing? So right. if it's someone who's in a physical abuse or sexual abuser, you're probably not going to get them, but a coach understanding that the way that they're speaking to and screaming is emotional abuse is, is the place. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. And, and again, we, yeah, we just, you know, again, speak a lot about the sexual abuse, but the, the, the emotional and physical abuse, again, harder to identify, harder to say, what is that line? What's good coaching versus what's crossing the line um, to, you know, crazy coach syndrome, as I call it, or, or you know, and, and, and by the way, I always also talk about crazy parent syndrome, um, all things you're going to probably have to deal with at some point in time. Um, but, but from a safe sport standpoint, the, the code and the best practices are also to protect you as coaches. So you may, you may be the best coach on the planet. But if you're not implementing a too deep leadership approach, for example, and making sure that you or your coaching staff are never alone with an athlete behind closed doors, um, that, and, th and that you are taking the necessary um, precautions and, and using best practices to make sure that um, uh, that, that that doesn't happen, that someone knows that that, uh, that meeting is taking place. That doesn't mean you can never have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with an athlete. Um, but if, if, if you're working one-on-one -on -one with a student or an athlete after hours and you're the only two people in the building, that's not acceptable. It's just, it's no longer acceptable. And, you know, for me, you know, what, what, transpired, um, you know, in the world of athletics growing up um, was probably ill-advised then, and it's totally unacceptable now. So you understanding how to protect yourselves, it could be completely innocent on your part, but it puts you in a vulnerable position if you're not, um, if you're not implementing best practices that will protect you so that you have another uh, coach or an adult uh, that is able to vouch for um, how you spoke to a uh, an athlete, or how, um, uh, or that the fact that you were not, you know, behind closed doors, um, uh, you know, speaking to or or um, coaching an athlete. Questions? Yeah, listen. Uh, I just have a question. On side of things. So I come from an MGB background and I've worked with two different MGBs and I know a lot of these types of cases, no one wants to take responsibility. So from two sides, either they don't want to report because they're afraid of the repercussions of reporting um, and that goes from volunteers all the way down the pipeline to you know, parents and um, uh, other participants. Um, what is What's your, do you, have you, are you going to have a liaison for each NGB that's earmarked so that parents and the members of each NGB know who to go to to report the things that aren't related to sexual assault? Because we know that those go straight to you. Um, but right. the community is educated, and is that, what's the training around that kind of maybe liaison? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, thanks for, for say, stating that as well. By the way, just one quick aside, um, and make sure I answer your question, but from uh, from the, the center standpoint, if it is of a sexual nature, that could come anonymously to us. That could come from a third party that said, hey, I saw something. It could could, could come from the, the um, victim themselves. 
And that could come from a phone call, an email, our online form that you'll see on, on the website. It can come from any of those. So it does not have to come directly from the victim, if you will. Um, the, so how will non-sexual um, uh, cases or reports come? They will come into the NGBs. Um, and there is a safe sport coordinator identified for every national governing body. So um, how that gets, how that information gets um, shared with uh, the constituents of each NGB is largely up to them. So, you know, we've created, doc we've created documents that, that they can co-brand, for example. So it's a safe sport document that, that, you know, USA Hockey can put their logo on and send out to all of their members. Um, and so we hope that that will um, help the communication. And I, again, then they're putting their contact information on there uh, from a safe sport uh, standpoint. Um, so hope, hopefully that makes sense, what I, what I just said. But yeah, every NGB will have a safe sport contact in which um, violations can be reported. Thank you. So Shelly, you would, um, I understand with the, when we're talking about NGBs that you have a relationship and, you're, and you, you, know, you work with, with each of them, your, your center does. But if there was a, a report that came in of uh, sexual abuse from a group, maybe even a local organization, um, and, uh, and it was dealt with through your response and resolution office, do you, you had talked about how you can provide sanctions to coaches. My guess is that's only with those partner organizations. What would happen if it was through uh, a local sport organization in Morgantown, West Virginia? How you know? I don't. I'm guessing you don't have any authority to to give sanctions yeah. to coaches, or how would that look? Right. So assuming it wasn't, um, let's say, a, a pool or a gym or a club um, that was sanctioned or, 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 you know, under the, uh, was not a member of a national governing body. And of course, there, there are a lot of local, you know, clubs and gyms, et cetera, that are. So they would, they would be under the jurisdiction of uh, the NGBs and therefore under our jurisdiction. But let's say they're not. They're just, a, you know, a, a dojo or a, a club or a pool that is not associated with any NGB. So if we received a, um, a report of a, of a sexual misconduct or abuse violation, um, what we would do is A, encourage them to report to the police, to law enforcement. Um, we, would, we, we have deemed ourselves a mandatory reporter, so we would report to the, to the law enforcement and then we would whatever if, if that if let's say it was a little league if, just for for just to throw it out as a hypothetical let's say it was a little league organization or something we would call little league um at least nationally um and let them know that this is what came in we don't have jurisdiction we've reported it we've encouraged the local folks um, to report it um, but we wanted you to know that this is happening, that this, this has happened and, um, and, and, you know, let them, um, then follow up. What happens then is, you know, we want to track those types of things because, um, that's all part of the, you know, understanding kind of where, uh, the reports and potential abuse are coming from. Thank you. Shirley, what do you think, and the, or what do you see as the greatest resistance or the challenge to, I mean, I know you're relatively new for a month here, but it's been around for a couple of years, 2011 or 2012 since Safe Sport was formalized, I think, within the U.S. to see prior to Safe Sport launch. What, what do you think is either bad or you think will be the, the biggest resistance? Yeah. yeah, you know, I think, it, you know, change is hard. And, um, you know, let's face it, you know, most coaches are awesome people, you know, they're really good. They, they're, they are, they're well-meaning and they just want to coach and they understand, um, 
and are doing the best that they can to create uh, you know, future leaders and, and, and people that are upstanding citizens, et cetera. Um, there, there's always going to be bad people out there. And unfortunately, sport um, provides an opportunity for people to misbehave, if you will. Um, so, you know, I think it's just resistance of, um, you know, that I'm that, you know, even even if I'm a really good coach and I have, have no ill intent that I'm going to be um, unfairly um, unfairly, you know, accused. Uh, and again, that's why, you know, we know, you know, I have no doubt that we will get a case where um, somebody's kid didn't make the team and a disgruntled parent um, decides that, well, they'll, they'll show that, that coach and, and, and perhaps put in a false claim. Um, so we, we have to have a fair process by which we investigate and root out uh, false claims. And that will in turn, um, as, as, as we have um, cases and as we um, are able to root out the bad actors, and protect the coaches that have been wrongly, um, let's say wrongly accused, um, that that will assure and, and reassure uh, everyone in, associated with sports that, um, you know, that we're handling things well. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, I think that in terms of, of resistance, if you will, of, it's just the fear of the unknown and are we gonna be a fair, arbiter of um of cases that come in and so our our performance will prove that our performance will prove that i think the other challenge quite frankly is is resources and you know we all know that um you know it's just it's resources especially um on the awareness and education side so part of part of my job a big part of my job is to go raise a whole lot of funds uh, so that we can do uh, an, uh, an awareness campaign that we can do the training and outreach uh, that we want to do um, um, among all those groups that I mentioned earlier. Any other questions? Shelley, before we let you go, I have one more. Given that we have largely in the audience students, and a lot of them are undergrads, um, and I know that there'll be more undergrads watching this, and a couple of my doc students and, and some of the other folks that couldn't make it, given what the Safe Sports mission is and what you're very passionate about. What words of wisdom or what, what would you like to share with these folks as what they could do in their careers to help this move? Sure, you know, I would say, um, I would say don't put your heads in the sand. You know, don't say, well, this doesn't concern me because I know I'm a good person. Um, it does concern you. And, and it, it, it's going to take all of us to make sure that sport uh, is, is allowed to grow and prosper and that individuals are safe, supported, and strengthened through sport. So it is your job. It, it is your job, whatever, if you're a coach, if you're an administrator, um, heck, if you're a parent of a kid that's in sport. Um, and again, at all levels, to make sure that athletes have a safe environment in which to uh, perform, if you will, that they're, they're supported at every level and that they're strengthened um, as an individual, as a human being, um, that is totally your responsibility uh, and, and, and an opportunity for you to really grow um, sport for sport's sake, but more importantly, to grow each individual that you have purview over. Um, so let me be the first to thank you um, to thank you for uh, a your, just your interest in, in safe sport, but all that you will do going forward to make sure that athletes are safe, supported, and strengthened. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you all, and onward, onward. <laughs> thank you, Shelley. With that, I'll go ahead and stop the recording and, and end the, the go-to. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Take care.